Washington Commission bi-weekly meeting. Uh, recording has begun at this point. So thank you for that, Aaron. So um, to go through the agenda, first comments for me, there are none, so that is quick. Um, so Dave, floor is yours. Great, yeah, um, I'm in South Amherst and it's quite a storm down here. So uh, yeah, if I, get, if I get scared, if the lights go out and I get scared, you know, I'll be back as soon as the thunder and lightning is over. Um, yeah, I'll be fairly quick. Um, I did send an email to Brett. I'm hoping to talk about the uh, Keith Haskins uh, conservation restriction later on. We're under kind of a, a time crunch with that document. I don't think it's anything earth shattering. So we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. Um, overall, I think things are going pretty well. Uh, we are continuing our efforts at Buffers Pond. We still have some staff from other departments. Uh, that's as, as things um, as demands increase later in August, I think that's going to get a little tougher to um, to staff with um, folks from LSSC and other departments. Um, I did get authorization from the town manager to hire two additional summer staff, so that's great. They'll be coming on, I think, as early as next week, and um, this is actually going to be paid for through some of the COVID funding that we're getting from the federal government. So um, they'll be able to help Brad and Tyler out on the trails. Um, they'll be able to help at Buffer Spawn. So I think that'll be a, a good little shot in the arm for Brad and Tyler. Um, we continue to test the pond um, weekly and it passed um, uh, very easily yesterday and we post those, uh, those uh, results online. Um, the conservation budget uh, was, part, was approved, if you will, as part of the the overall town budget on Monday night, the town council voted uh, the FY21 budget, which is great. Um, we are gonna be doing some different things with some of our funding within the department. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those uh, in, in that, that in two weeks, but it, it's all good. Um, we're gonna be shifting some, uh, some funding from uh, administration and get more support uh, for me and for Aaron and for Brad and Tyler uh, out in the field. So I'll fill you in a little bit more on that. Again, no new funding. This is simply um, uh, reallocating money from within the budget uh, for Libby Lass's position that was, um, you were, many of you worked with Libby and she retired last year. Um, the Fort River Watershed Group, uh, I don't know if any of you are on their list, sir, but they're doing good work. They're actually doing, um, they're doing water testing in the Fort River Watershed. Um, and we can get you some of those results. May, I don't know if Aaron is on that uh, listserv, but some of you might be interested to know uh, what's, you know, what they're looking at in, in terms of uh, the Fort River watershed. So we can get you that information. Dave, is there a way that we can get on that listserv? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, let me, yeah, I'll shoot an email to uh, Brian Yellen, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I think you'd be really interested. They're, they're, uh, they're testing the Amethyst Brook and the main stem of the Fort River and a couple of tributaries. So uh, we'll get you uh, that information. And if you want to be on the list, serv and get yet another email update, um, by all means. Um, That's all I've ever wanted. Email <laughs> the rivers. Let's see. Um, the Fearing Brook Project, Beth Wilson, who's now in DPW, is continuing to work on that. Um, I've asked her to give you all an update, so we could we could schedule that sometime in August or early September. Again, that work wouldn't happen until uh, 2021, but it might be good to have Beth come in or zoom in uh, on one of these calls and give you an update on where we are with that project. But all everything's moving forward. We have the funding. Um, yeah, so I, I think that project to restore some of the uh, Fairing Brook is, is gonna move forward. Um, I guess the last update, uh, uh, Fort River Farm, our conservation area off of uh, Route 9. I met with uh, Aaron and Stephanie Ciccarello today to talk about the community gardens down there, pollinator gardens. So I think our next step is to come before you with a notice of intent for um, making that, making that, I don't know if you can hear the thunder in the background. For that. Here. That was um, awesome. Um, it's up on, I'm up on Mount Pollux and um, anyway. Um, what was I? Uh, so Fort River Farm, 
So for a farm, we'll, we'll come to you with a notice of intent to improve the parking and the access down at Fort River Farm. So I, I hope that Stephanie can pull that notice of intent together and get it to you in September so we can get those gardens fully operational for spring of 21. Um, so that's all I have for now. Brad and Tyler are busy out there. It's, it's a two person show. It's a lot to take care of all summer trails and, and uh, mowing, but they're doing a nice job. I am getting reports about trails that are overgrown. So I'm meeting with Brad on Friday and we can, we can try to prioritize some of those trails that are just overgrown. So that's all I have tonight. Excellent, thank you, Dave. So any questions or comments for Dave? Hey Dave, does um, Tyler and um, Brad, do they do like um, trail work days? Uh, historically we have. Um, yeah. It's been a little tougher in the COVID, uh, in 2000, right. COVID. Um, how do you get people together? How do you do it safely? How to share tools? So we haven't really been, you know, focused on that too much. It's really kind of hunker down and do what we can with the people we have. I think, again, bringing on two seasonals, one will be 30 hours a week and one will be 40 hours a week. That'll give them a real boost because they can offload some of the, the routine trail maintenance and brushing of trails, and then they can focus on some bigger picture stuff. Excellent. Dave, you did just leave out one thing that was in front of CONCOM a while ago, it, which is that the dog park broke ground today, which is very exciting. So if you see that happening, I, uh, <laughs> I brought my own shovel and then was made fun of ruthlessly, but I thought we were supposed to bring our own shovels. So whatever, guys. But yeah. Was it a dog, uh, dog shaped shovel? It was not. And I almost debated bringing my dog and then thought, no, nah, someone else would do that. And nobody did. So I should have, but it's all, you know, but that's exciting. So just as an FYI, um, that'll be hopefully starting soon. What's yeah, the timeline good. for that one, Anna? Uh, it'll hopefully, t it'll start officially like things in dirt, whatever machines they decide to use uh, in September, right, Dave? And then it'll take about a year before it's all ready because after construction, they have to go grow a whole lot of grass. Um, so it'll hopefully September 21 is the date. So we will, there is a, a wetlands element to that. So yeah. we will, we the town will need to work closely with Aaron on erosion control and um, stabilization of the south end of that site, as you may recall, some of you who are out there. So yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. And yes, that was kind of a, a missed opportunity for people to bring dogs. I don't know why, why did none no. of us, you know, somebody should have brought a dog. But anyway. All right. Yeah, congratulations. So um, with that, Aaron, uh, so we still have about 15 minutes before our first agenda item. So would you like to start walking us through things? Sure. Sorry, I was doing some last minute edits to the PowerPoint here. Let me just make sure I've got it up on my screen before I share. OK. Yeah. Brett, while she's doing that, if there is any time before your first um, uh, before your first hearing, we could cover that CR if there was time. Um, but, I'm sorry, Dave. Can you say that again? We just had a huge crack of thunder. Yeah. You were saying if there is any time before your first uh, hearing uh, after Aaron um, gives a, her, her, her report, we could do that CR. It's probably about a six or seven minute item. Okay, great. Um, I mean, I there's there's quite a bit of other business on the agenda tonight. Um, so if we want to get through the CR first, or if we want to jump into other business, um, it's really um, I will defer to um, Brett and Dave on how you'd like to handle that. Yeah, I would. Why don't we do the CR now just to make sure. Um, particularly while we have Dave on and uh, we're moving. And power. <laughs> okay. Again, I, so um, I think Aaron, I don't know, uh, do you have that map that I sent you? Yes. So real, real quickly, um, um, as you can imagine, doing, uh, doing uh, conservation restrictions and, and work with the state and Kestrel has been pretty challenging uh, during COVID. Um, and so we're under, under a very strict timeline to get this conservation restriction on record. So I apologize for the speed on this. Um, conservation restrictions, as you know, we've done a number of them through the years with you all. Um, 
they're fairly straightforward, but in short, and for those people who might be listening, I don't know if you can, can you um, rotate that by chance? Um, I should so, be able to. So while Aaron's doing that, um, we recently, the town recently purchased with a land grant uh, about 46 acres of land off of uh, Market Hill Road from the Coles Company. Uh, this was a high priority for the commission and for the town. So we own it. It is permanently protected. But the town, or excuse me, the state requires a conservation restriction to be placed on the land, uh, essentially as a, as a, as a second uh, line of defense, if you will. If the town, you know, 50 years from now says we need to do something different with that that parcel that the town bought in 2020, um, the state is saying you need to have a third party uh, holder of that uh, conservation restriction. And in this case, it's it's usually and always our partner, the Kestrel Trust. So uh, Keith Haskins is, is kind of outlined um, in green, some of the land um, on one side uh, on the, I guess it's on the right side of my screen is actually in, uh, in Shutesbury, but we basically own everything up to the Shutesbury line. And this abuts the Haskins Meadow property off of East Leverett Road and includes some frontage along the Cushman Brook. I just lost power for a second and I bet that's Dave, we seem to have lost you. Can you hear us? Guys, I just lost. I'm in South Amherst, too. Oh, fuck, Sandy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my God. I'm still here, and I'm in South Amherst, too. So. It, it, it looks like we lost Fletcher, too. I know. I think power went out uh, uh, across town. <laughs> That's not allowed. We're having a conservation commission meeting. I know. Don't they know? <laughs> so. Yeah. So why don't we just give them a minute and see if they come back on? Yeah. It might be folks might want to just jot down the call in number for the Zoom um, on your meeting invite, just in case um, you lose your Wi-Fi or something. Um, Aaron, can you post that? So for yes. people who are, um, so we lost about six people who were um, from the public as well. Actually, I lost power too, but I have an un uninterruptible power supply. And so it kept me on my computer and sub system up, but the power is gone. Yeah, mine just went out for a second, but um, I think I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know. Brett, you're in South Amherst too? Yeah, I'm, I'm in South Amherst. Or Larry? I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm down near I'm down, down near Hickory Ridge. I'm right near the golf course. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm in like the deep south, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got that means you've got more mosquitoes than me. Yes, but we also have more lightning bugs, so it's pretty. <laughs> That's true. I'm about to tell my son. My son, the last time he was here, was out looking for places to take pictures of lightning bugs. Oh yeah. Out here. He found, he found some good ones. Mount Pollux is a good spot. Is it? Okay, I'll tell him that. So any one of those numbers, Aaron? Yes, yep, any one of those numbers. And um, just make sure you write down the webinar ID as well. You know, actually, actually when my son was down here looking for the lightning bugs, he scared some animals in the backyard, and I've got a wonderful picture of two young raccoons in a tree in my backyard. <laughs> uh, do I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna email this really quickly to um, Dave and Fletcher in case. Uh, Leroy, we also lost Leroy. Oh boy. Well, depending on how long we go, you may lose me too, and my interruptible, uninterruptible power supply goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
I'll just send it to everybody just in case. Uh, it, that information is also in the email that we get as an auto reminder. It's on the, concert, yeah, it's on the, it's on the uh, agenda. If you look on the agenda, it's all on there. Yeah, it is on the agenda as well. Um, Well, if, if anybody else needs it, I'll forward it along. Um, so. Do we only have four of us? Uh, yes. Yeah, technically, we still have quorum. Yeah, and Dave is back on now. We're starting to come back on. Okay. So we can see you again, Dave. Oh, almost. Are you back now, Dave? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Brett? Now I can. Yeah, the floor is back on here. That's okay. So, so, uh, so where was I? So, can you hear me now? Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. If you could just wait one sec. So we lost a couple of other people. So Fletcher's back on. Uh, Leroy is the only one who's not back on yet, and we're still missing about five people from the public are no longer on the call as well. Uh, you let me know when, when you think you're ready. Okay. Yeah, let's just give Leroy another minute and then we'll pick um, up. Brett, what do we do if the, if the public can't participate? Is there a phone number for them to dial in too? If they're... Yes. Yep, that same phone number. Um, yeah, I can post all that in the chat as well. No, oh, I mean, not, not, not for me. I'm just thinking about if people have joined specifically for an agenda item. Uh, yeah, they can it, come on phone. It is listed on the agenda as well. So anybody who accessed the agenda um, to get on should be able to get the info to call in. It looks like we have chat turned off though, so. Oh yeah, you don't allow chat anymore. Hey Dave, what, how do you, how do you access, how does the, um, how do the guys access um, Haskin Meadows to mow, like on the other side of the brook? Hold on one second. Oh, sorry. Just trying to. Okay. So, um, Fletcher had asked, how do they access uh, Haskins Meadow? Yeah, how do you get over there? You know where they mow? You know where the sign is? And they, yeah. you know, they, get, they use that guy's driveway? They do, yeah. yeah we, okay. I think That's we have an problem. easement over his driveway to get him back there. Gotcha. Okay. That's my question of the day. Okay, so I'm not sure um if Leroy is going to be able to come back on but so why don't we continue um with the CR and then hopefully Leroy will be back on by our 7 30. So, so Aaron, Aaron why don't you jump to the document itself so conservation restrictions uh as the name indicates they they restrict the owner from doing uh, certain things that might be detrimental to the conservation interest of the property I think we've seen these before again uh, cell phone towers, tennis courts, uh, buildings, um, roads, uh, things of that sort are all um, um, uh, prohibited uses. In this case, the only thing that makes this conservation restriction a little bit different, and Aaron may be able to scroll down um, and we can see the section um, uh, on certain uses that are allowed, the one thing, and we've talked about this before, that is allowed here, and you can see this is these are why you know these are the, the the background statements as to why the land is important and why we protected it. Um, we do have reserved rights in this case. So the 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 main reserved right in this CR 
is a little different than most conservation restrictions we have because the water line from Atkins Reservoir goes under this property. There's a 10 inch water line from Atkins Reservoir that goes to the Atkins um, treatment plant, which is right in Cushman. So this, um, we, there was always an easement for that that was on the property. So we basically followed that language and that what that does is it allows the town to maintain and replace that. Uh, you can scroll down further to the um, retained rights. It, it allows the town in the future to go through the Kestrel Trust to maintain the 10 inch water line uh, that serves Atkins Reservoir and brings water down to the town of Amherst. So that uh, easement was a 40 foot easement. Uh, it allows the town to go in on one of those arms of the property off of Market Hill Road. And that's, that's really the significant difference between this and other CRs that we've, um, we've done in the past. So I think I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. What's all the uh, forestry stuff there? Can, you can, al it allows forestry? Yes. Yeah, it just That's says need a plan or something. No. Yeah, it allows forestry, have to follow best management practices, go through the state, state forester if it's of a certain size. Um, we did not include, you know, significant agriculture. This is a completely forested parcel. So we didn't see the need for adding, um, you know, traditional agriculture or that any of it would be tilled. Um, there are wetlands on the site. So obviously, we, if anything, uh, if the uh, DPW wanted to do the anything to the water line, they would have to file with the commission and with the with the Kestrel Trust to do that work. So it allows trail, it allows trails to be built on the on the um, on the property. And if say we wanted a I don't know a, an educational um, structure like a bird blind to be built with permission, we could do a bird blind or a, a teaching hut if you wanted to have a little teaching um, simple structure for bringing uh, children out into nature, you could do that with permission of the Kestrel Trust. So. Can we, and you, can you park up there on uh, Market Hill Road, that access? You can, it allows uh, the, the CR, um, we, I don't think we have time to go through every section, but the CR allows, um, I think we, we excluded or we, we reserve the right for one or two, there we go, parking areas. Got it. There we go. Access to parking areas should be located via either area A, B, or C, and those are the, uh, the, um, the long, thin parcels that go out to Market Hill Road. So in the future, we could develop a simple crushed stone parking lot or two to uh, provide access for hikers and, and whatnot. Cool. So I think way at the end of the document, there's actually language, Aaron, if you scroll all the way to the um, um, signature pages, I think we can use the Conservation Commission signature page for a motion. Um, let's see which page, I think you have to go, keep going, here we go. So that, if someone were willing to make a motion um, and you could use language from this. Uh, can we, we have enough, we have quorum? Yeah, sorry, we're all here, right? Yeah. Uh, no, we're still missing Leroy, but yeah. Um, so we definitely have quorum, so we're good there. Um, like me. From my opinion, I mean, this is great. I'm impressed that the town and state are still moving forward, so that's excellent. Um, but does anybody have any questions before we entertain a motion or comments? No. Okay, so if people are all comfortable with it, then yeah, we'll move into a motion. If The motion could be something like, you like, know. Yeah, did we just read that? I, I move to grant a conservation yeah. restriction to the Castro Land Trust pursuant to Section 8C of Chapter 40. All right, I got it. So, all right, I move to 
literally say what Dave just said. I move to grant this conservation restriction to the Kestrel Land Trust pursuant to Section 8C of Chapter 40 and Chapter 44B of the Massachusetts General Laws and pursuant to Town Council Order of June 17th, 2019, uh, which you can see in this document at Exhibit C and grant the uh, foregoing conservation restriction. Second. Yeah. Excellent. So Fletcher, how do you vote? Aye. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. And aye for me. So we are good here. Um, at this point, can we just use e-signatures, Aaron, or is there something else we need to do? That's a good question. We have authorized um, e-signatures and actually, um, I can, I can, I can check with the town clerk because I know she has your, um, your ID on file already, Brett. So I'll check with, I'll check with Dave and, um, the town clerk on that before it's notarized. And, and if we had an issue, Brett, if you're around in the next couple of days, I could probably find you and I'd be happy to run this socially distanced over to you to to sign. So we'll we'll work it out in the next 48 hours to get it in. And I'd be happy to meet you out on the front steps of Town Hall as well, Dave. So great. Thank you. Meet him at the Henion. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'm I'm listening. I just have to make sure that there's not a leak because I'm hearing a lot of a lot of water here in, in the space I'm in. So I'll be right back. But thank you. This want, yeah, buddy. That ain't good. Okay, so um, I do have 7.30, um, so I think we should go ahead and start our 7.30 agenda item. And so this is a continuation for abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for Shutesbury Road, uh, map 9B, parcels 11 and 12. So hopefully the people who are here from the public to talk about this are back on. And so if you could raise your hand and then I will promote you to a panelist. Uh, okay, so I got you, Maria. Is there somebody else with you, Maria, that should be a panelist or? Uh, Evan Turner may be participating tonight, but I'm not 100% clear on that. Okay, so I do not see that person, so I think we are good then. Okay, so Maria, if you wouldn't mind reintroducing yourself and just give us a brief um, update about where we're at and the last set of materials that you submitted. And uh, I took a look at stuff and uh, hopefully we're in good shape at this point. So, Yes, yeah, so uh, Maria Furstenberg with TRC, we're representing W.D. Coles, um, who's the property owner and applicant for the ANRAD. Um, at this point, we have done all of the in-field review with the peer reviewer that was requested and at the last meeting that we were at um, you had requested formal response to the last set of the peer reviewers comments um, and we provided that uh, a week ago um, so th they were mostly things that we have discussed with you before or they were fairly straightforward edits to the plan set for example um, an old version of the plan set had potential vernal pool in the legend instead of just vernal pool all that kind of stuff has been addressed um, the other major thing that happened during this last deliverable uh, is that there there have been a lot of questions about the flag numbering at the site uh, it was basically a product of that because the wetlands expanded, several wetlands got combined. So we had uh, repeat flag numbers in a couple of different complexes. So what we did um, is we provided you two sets of plans. We provided a plan that has the flag numbers that match what's currently in the field um, so that if someone were to go out now that they'd be able to find where they were. Um, but we also submitted a plan uh, that says corrected flag numbers as part of the title 
that uh, essentially took any area that had an odd flag numbering system in it and we edited those flag numbers to be whole consecutive numbers um, and we requested that uh, you include a condition on the ORAD that before that that any future filings use the corrected flag numbers and that before any potential future construction could take place that the site would have to be refreshed to match the corrected flag numbers. Um, I think that that's everything. Uh, if, if you want to pass it around to Aaron or whoever else you want to pass it to. Great. Thank you, Maria. So Aaron, um, so do you have any comments or materials that you want to start us off with or that you want to? Yeah. Um, I was thinking basically of kind of, uh, going through the comments, um, responses from TRC, just briefly touching on a few points um, and just highlighting a few things for the commission. Um, and if, if the board is comfortable with, um, with issuing the ORAD this evening, um, I spoke with Mark Stinson earlier today because the confusion with the two plan sets, I wanted to make sure that we're able to, in a, the, the ORAD form doesn't really provide for conditions, um, so to speak, like an order of conditions would. It basically just says, are the resource boundaries confirmed or not? So um, he recommended that we attach what is called a statement of fact to the ORAD, which basically clarifies exactly what Maria just described, basically noting there's two separate plans. One is the field flagging, one is the revised flagging system. And I can go into that in a little more detail, sort of some narrative points that I would suggest including as part of that finding of fact. Um, that way, if three years from now, there's an extension or there's a notice of intent within a three year period, we have a paper trail that kind of helps to explain to future commissioners exactly what the decision making process was. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is just just some points of um, sort of clarification. So um, Emily made a note about um, GPS um, and the accuracy of um, GPS in order to identify the flags. I know on the last call I had asked about the survey quality of the flagging. I was under the impression from testimony at the last hearing that the flags had actually been surveyed, but um, it sounds like they've all been, the points have been GPSed. Um, so from my perspective, um, that doesn't necessarily mean each point is accurate. Um, you know, there may be certain levels of accuracy for each point with a GPS. There can be a lot of error depending on um, the canopy cover where points are taken. So um, that's mostly just a point of information um, on this that they were, the points were GPSed. If it was an open site, um, I wouldn't be as concerned about the GPS, um, or if it was a smaller site, maybe not, but this being such a large forested site, I think that's an important thing for you guys to be aware of. Um, it may be something where you would want to include in the statement of fact that those flags should be surveyed prior to um, a project coming forward so that the you know, accuracy of the points is pinned down in the field. That's just something to consider. Um, sorry, this is really hard to operate because I'm remote in my work computer. So um, the riverfront area on the plan is noted as estimated. And um, Maria, do you want to just really quickly um, explain to the board the methodology that was used to um, 
just get that line on the on the plan? Right. So that that goes back to the May fifteenth meeting um, that was based on the site visit that the board had, um, where we essentially agreed that the uh, widest piece of the river from mean annual high water to mean annual high water um, was 23 feet. So the methodology that we used was to um, extrapolate a line 11 and a half feet to either side of the GIS center line that we had available to us. And then we based the 200 feet off of that. And just to clarify that, that wasn't a decision that was made by the board in the field. That was based on a discussion with the applicant, um, my professional recommendation, as well as our peer reviewers recommendation in the field. So that's how we arrived at that being the best possible estimate that we could put on the plan. And the reason for that is because the brook itself is off site and um, the landowner does not own the property um, that the that Adams Brook is on so they weren't able to go out there and physically delineate it so that estimated line is on there to show the estimated location and we did our best to guide the applicant in showing that on the plan set but I just want to state for the record the Commission is not obligated to approve that as a resource area boundary if the Commission is comfortable approving it as such you may, if you're not, you don't have to. That was just based on our best estimation that we could do with the information that, that we had. So just to put that out there. Um, so there's a series of comments that basically address the flagging issue. Um, and Maria touched on this also, which is that the flagging in the field doesn't necessarily make consecutive make sense from a consecutive numbering standpoint. Um, and so they did their best basically from the original flagging system to the revised flagging system, um, which was devised when our peer reviewer went out and made recommendations on changing boundaries. They did their best to um, hang flags where they needed to be. And I think my understanding is Emily was comfortable with the flagging as it is in the field. Um, it's the numbering system is off and so we have an existing flagging system in the field and then we have a revised numbering system which is which makes a little bit more sense and my thinking was to include in the statement of fact basically that prior to extending this order of resource area delineation for an additional three years um, or um, prior to reviewing a notice of intent application that comes forward that the flagging should be revised in the field with the flagging system as represented on the revised plan so that um, in the future the flags that are in the field actually represent what's what's approved on the revised plan set. So that would be my recommendation and it sounded like TRC in several of their comments um, sort of supported that. Um, can I clarify that really quickly, Erin? Okay. Um, we, we are asking that before work has to happen. Um, part, part of the reason that we made this request and decided to do two plans like this is because it's a pretty big field effort to go out and change all of these flags. Um, and it's a pretty typical condition on an order of conditions to require that flagging be refreshed before any work can take place. So the, the intent here, because of the amount of work that's already gone into all of this, was to not have to refresh flags until ground was actually going to break somewhere. Um, so I just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Well, so, okay. So that's that's from TRC's perspective, and I yeah, that's, that's that's great. I just wanted to to clarify that that was our perspective and and yep. what we had tried to communicate in these comments. My apologies if if okay. that was not clear before. Okay. Yeah. No. That's that's fair enough. Um, so 
that, you know, TRC would like to only do the reflagging prior to breaking ground, my recommendation would be have the flagging revised prior to issuing an extension on this ORAD. And the reason for that is because if, if for example, three years from now, they say we want to extend this ORAD, when we go out to check the flagging in the field to see if it has changed, the flagging Flag system is going to be a disaster to go out there and, and check it. Um, so that's why I would recommend that prior to an extension being issued that we require the revised flags to be replaced in the field. And also, if there's a future notice of intent that comes through, we're going to be doing a site walk and looking at resource boundaries and the flagging system. We don't want to be a flagging system that does not make sense because that will make a review very confusing. Um, just my recommendation. It's up to the board on how to proceed with that. We're totally on board with the extension part because the the idea is essentially that that we don't want to have to do this more times than we need to and there's such a lag um, between actually submitting something and getting it approved and breaking ground that it's just an expensive thing to, to have to do unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and we totally respect that it will be necessary at some point. Um, so that that makes sense. Uh, thanks. Okay, so a lot of these comments are just referring back to the flagging system. Okay, that multiple of these are referring back to the flagging system. So I just want to make sure they're just referring back. We've submitted a corrected, a corrected plan. Um, I don't have any issues with most of these. Um, just try to get down. Sorry, this is, there's like a lag when I click on this because I'm um, remote. <laughs> so I apologize if it looks like I'm moving slower than I am. Um, just by way of an update on this item, which is the comment number 19 um, regarding certification of rental pools, I did finally <laughs> reach um, Shane Baginosi at Kohl's and he said, um, my understanding is Kohl's typically does not support um, putting an encumbrance on their property. And by that, he meant certifying the vernal pools. He's not sure that that's something that the company would support. And also because they're under contract right now with the developer um, that he's not sure that even legally speaking because of that, they could, um, support that. Um, that doesn't mean that the town already has the documentation so the town could do it without Cole's approval or without Cole's permission but um, Shane was going to speak with the owner and review some of the legal background information to see kind of what their stance was on that and get back to me. So that is still in in the works. Um, Regardless of that, um, you know, we have documentation that these are vernal pools. And so um, it is recommended that in the statement of fact that we basically state that the vernal pools should be treated and protected as though they are certified into the future, regardless of whether um, the actual certification takes place or not. Sorry, Aaron, can you just, uh um, but I, I, I got to jog my memory here, but at least the vernal pools are on the site plan. And you're saying that yes. at least we'll take out the potential and just call them vernal pools. They're called vernal pools. Yeah. yeah. Potential okay. is taken so off. Potential's out. They're going to be called vernal pools. So then, okay, cool. I'm yeah, just saying horrible. that we, in our statement of fact, that we state that we're deeming them vernal pools and that they would be okay. treated as such under the regulations, regardless okay. of whether they become certified. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and I think that's all of the comments. Um, yeah, I think the major attachments that are left are just the, the huge table. So, so one of the yeah, things yeah. That, that we provided was a table of what the field condition flag numbers are versus what the corrected flag numbers are. 
um, and then the latitude and longitude for each flag, just for your record so that you know exactly how things were changed. Um, yeah, and this would be helpful for us should we ever um, need to go out in the field and if things are ever confusing out there, but nonetheless, I think it's important for us to consider the future, um, what might come down the road and the confusion that, that, that it could cause. But I think this is a good mitigation <laughs> to keep things as orderly as we possibly can. Um. Hey, thank you, Aaron. That's very helpful. Um, so starting off with commissioners, comments, thoughts about what Maria said, what Aaron said. So uh, related to that first point, um, Maria, related to the GPS accuracy, do you know what the accuracy ended up being at the end of the day? I saw that you post process, but do you know if it's what that is? Uh, it's usually within six inches. Okay. Oh. Is that is that? That's cool. On, That's nice. You got GPS. You only goes six inches. Is that is that based on prior experience or or? or uh, what? It's it's based on prior experience, but also this specific site. Um, so. The post-processing looks at the standard deviation between the satellites um, and it, it can sometimes give you bigger numbers um, when you're in a canopy area, like Aaron said, uh, but we do have a very accurate GPS unit and it is our protocols that we don't save a point unless we can get the accuracy that we need in the field. Uh, the program that we use um, and the equipment that we have actually gives us real time um, where we're at. So there's that, but we also have had many flags surveyed that we've also GPSed and out of tens of thousands of flags, I've only seen flags moved twice from what the surveyor has found versus what we had. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident in the level of accuracy that we have. Uh, Aaron, how, how were you, when you brought this up, um, were you seeing big deviations from flags in the field versus the site plan? No. Um, clearly that, yeah, cause why no. would. No. Okay. I mean, the reason I brought this up is yeah. because I used to work prior, I mean, for, for several years, I worked in consulting um, myself, GPSing wetland flags. And um, I think in a, in a closed canopy situation like that with a handheld GPS unit, um, to say that you've got six inch accuracy, I think is, I mean, I don't know what kind of GPS unit was being used that that strikes me as being yeah I mean I think I think my I think my my feeling on this is that um, as long as prior to any sort of project implementation we do an actual uh, survey and and look at the flags um, otherwise I mean I don't feel comfortable using anything but uh, a physical survey to estimate flags We have very new equipment. Um, I don't know how recently Aaron has used a GPS unit. I know that I've used a GPS unit over the past decade and that the accuracy has improved significantly in the past few years. Um, it is also the industry standard that gets used for National Grid and Eversource and many of your larger projects. This is what all of their consultants do. We are one of them. So it's yeah. So it, it, that it, is that it is true. Not it's it, be a huge concern here. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean. I, yeah, Larry. I just want to close this out. So 
Um, that being said, I, I still feel pretty strongly about um, that. That's my opinion. Um, that I have flags prior to any sort of project being um, approved for this uh, parcel of land. But that wouldn't impact us on on this right now. You know, w one of my concerns is we're talking about the idea of six to ten inches. You know, the, 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 the site could have changed in the last six months or the next six months of that kind of accuracy. I think that we're getting into the nitty gritty of getting beyond the idea of what we can actually reinforce. Which I think is, is also backing up what Laura is saying about prior to doing another project, that's when we need to physically have everything checked. So I think yeah. that, I mean, yeah. but, I, but I don't think that that's as relevant to what we're dealing with right now in front of us. Because that's if, an, if yeah, that, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying is that we're we're talking about nitty gritty things that really we can't we can't really deal with really. Well, eventually, when we have to get it down to doing something future, then it makes sense to clearly define those. At that point, you might even argue that the uh, wetlands has changed if it's five years on. S so I, I just want to address a couple comments that were made. So, so GPS is the industry standard, particularly for um, utilities. I definitely agree with that. Um, I mean, I think that a linear utility project where um, you might be doing uh, pole maintenance or pole replacement um, is very different from a site where you're talking about basically a, a forested area that's going to be um, cleared and development going in. Um, in this situation, I think it's very different. And I think, so, I mean, the, the question was asked how long ago I used a GPS unit in the field. Um, 2016 was the most recent I was out doing field work. And you know, you might be lucky if you could get, um, you know, within a couple feet with a, with a mm -hmm. GPS accuracy. I mean, and right. again, I don't know what kind of unit they're using and the accuracy. Typically what happens is each, it's not like the whole survey has an accuracy level. It's every point when it's post-processed gives an indicator of accuracy. So one point might be within a few inches, another point might be within six feet, another point might be within three feet, um, which, is, which is not to say what they're presenting is not okay. I'm just saying when it comes to reviewing a development plan, I think it's a really responsible thing to do to have a surveyed plan at that point with the flags in the field. Again, both sides could argue with this five years from now. We're having climate change. If we go into a, man, a mansion, a, 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 a lot of monsoon areas in the Northeast and it changes the wetlands, both sides could argue one way or the other in terms of doing it then. I mean, right for now, I think we're arguing about pins and needles. Yeah, and the big thing that we're trying to figure out right now, I mean, the primary is, are we okay where where the flags are now? This is more of an issue for how they get located in the future. I agree. I agree. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think for the statement of fact is merely to, um, for the commission to provide sort of a recommendation to itself moving forward of things that would be um, important to identify that were noted on the record as being important on this site, pertinent to the, the um, delineation. And again, if you guys are comfortable with the GPS, I know we've been comfortable with it on other sites, um, then that's fine. I just wanted to point it out because the statement was made on the record that the points were surveyed and they were actually GPS and they're two very different things. I, I apologize if that was my error on the record. We we typically in our office call it a GPS survey. So I, if I was not clear on that, I'm really sorry about it. Yeah, I mean, so as long as we know exactly what we're looking at, I'm okay with um, where we're at. And as long as that's demarcated in the record, maybe I'm just kicking the can down the road, but we will tell ourselves in the future, this is what it is. and 
figure out how to deal with it at that point. Thank Some you. of these don't go anywhere as well. So. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So we've had this issue with some of these properties before. So, or not an issue, but set of circumstances. Okay, so that is the, um, the location issue. Um, what about some of the, and so obviously there was lots of confusion around the points. I think we have a good uh, workable solution for that. Uh, and with the idea that that will need to be refreshed in the future before work happens. So I think we're, um, you know, in agreement there. Exactly when that happens, you know, if that's before an extension or before or when an NOI gets submitted, I guess we have to decide on that piece though. Um, so again, I mean, what we're deciding today is whether or not these points and lines are accurate as of today. And I think we're pretty much, I haven't heard any disagreement with that, so. Um, do any commissioners have a strong feeling about what we tell basically ourselves um, in the future regarding if an NOI comes, if an extension comes? Because an extension will come before us and at that point we have an opportunity to decide how we want to decide as well. Can you talk through that a little bit more, Brett? Like, what do you mean an extension for? Uh, so right you know. now, these points, we will quote unquote guarantee, I don't know if that's the right word, for three years. These are effective mm -hmm. for three years. So if they want to do something um, and they want to start making plans and doing all mm -hmm. that, they say that we are comfortable with these for the next three years. Yeah. Let's say their project takes longer and it takes five years. So they would have to come back within three years and say, we want an extension for two more years or three more years. And so at that point, we have the opportunity to say, yes, we're fine to extend it. No, we're not okay. Or, you know, somewhere in between. Yeah, no. Like, yeah, yeah my, my, my opinion of that would be um, that if we're going to do an extension, then the same process that was utilized for this would be done again. Um, to to receive an extension because I think our learnings as a you know to, to Larry's point things change and certainly things are changing more quickly than they have historically. Yeah, so, um, I agree. So, with it. I agree with. It. Those are also hypotheticals. We don't have an extension in front of us right now. No, no. I, I just so, think, but, no. but I, I agree we should have flexibility when the extension comes to go back and say we really need to look at this again. And yeah. we do. Yep, absolutely. I mean, you could say now that you're not issuing an extension, should it come back? Or you could say, we'll look at it in three years if it comes before us to make that decision. I like that. I like that. Time when we said nothing, no extension. So, I mean, my opinion would be we keep that on the table and we think through, obviously, very carefully. Right, mm -hmm. right. right. Again, yeah. so. they're, they're sorry to interrupt, but they're there is no extension unless we even come back and request something. So it, right. it's right. kind of a moot point unless it even comes up. Right. And, and honestly, I agree with the rest of you that it's, it's something that you would review again at that time and say, has it changed or not? Yeah, and so I mean, what I think Aaron is trying to do for us, which I appreciate is basically leave a trail <laughs> for ourselves in the future more or less so okay. so is is the commission comfortable with the way riverfront was estimated and if so are you comfortable approving that as the riverfront boundary on the order or um you, you could leave that out of the you know exclude that from the approval um, if you're uncomfortable with it and you want it actually to be flagged down the road, should a um, proposal come before the board? Is it, I'm sorry, um, is it, it, the reason it's on there is because a little bit of that estimated um, 
riverfront areas on the plan, like a little bit of it. Is that why exactly. we're exactly? Okay. Yeah. It, it overslaps the site very slightly in a couple of places. Our understanding from the March 15th meeting was that this was a methodology that the commission was comfortable with. That's why we did it this way. It was on the commission's recommendation. Um, yeah. So, so we're not talking about much territory. No. Um, do you, Aaron, I'm I don't know. Looking at, I'm looking at the map. Terrible, I'm looking at the map well, right now. If you yeah, I can, I can open the map, um, but I just want to make it clear the commission didn't approve it. It was a recommendation made by myself and Emily. Yeah. I, I understand that the commission didn't approve anything at that meeting, but our question to the commission was, what is something we can do here that you would feel comfortable approving? And this is what came out of that discussion. Correct. And the underlying issue is that the, the actual water body is off of their property. Erin, right. could you, um, which, which comment is that? Um, the riverfront area comment? Yeah, was that a... Yeah. Um, oh, wait. Okay. Is it 13? Uh, sorry, let me go back. It's to comment I... four. Oh, thank you, Maria. Thank sorry. You. No, 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 you're good. I was like somewhere in the 40s in this document, and I was like, this is not right. <laughs> Yeah, and I definitely recall the discussions that we had and yeah, in general, there was no issues that I recall from the commission. Um, it's a conservative approach, meaning that this was taken at a point lower down the water body. And so therefore, you know, it's likely slightly smaller, a little higher up, not certain, but likely. Um, but just so we know the options, Aaron, I mean, so what would happen right. in that piece was not approved. I mean, it, you would just exclude it. So in the form, you can say, um, we're approving all boundaries shown on the plan, or we are only um, approving specific resource area boundaries on the plan. Um, and in doing so, you can exclude specific boundaries. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with that, but I guess I'm confused about what that would mean to the applicant for that area. Does that mean that that area that is currently considered riverfront is not considered riverfront? Is that... Um, so if, if you don't mind me answering, uh, from, from our perspective, we would continue to consider riverfront, but if you don't approve it as part of the ORAD, then it basically means that this conversation comes back up with future filings about do we agree on where it is and right. un unless the applicant um, gains control of the property with the, the brook on it in the future, the answer is going to continue to be, you know, we don't have access to it so we can't delineate it in the field. This is the best that we can do right now. Yeah, I mean, there's there are other solutions. I mean, I've seen in situations like this, the landowner gets permission from the neighboring landowner to um, place flags so that lines can be set. Um, but um, it's really at the commission's discretion um, as to whether you feel comfortable with where the estimated line is, because if you approve it as such, then that is the riverfront boundary that's set in stone should a project come before the board. Hold on, hold on. Uh, that's the boundary that is set in stone? The, the GPS? Correct. For, for, well, for the duration of the ORAD, so for the three years. Correct. It's, it's the same meaning as accepting the rest of the wetland lines that are here. Exactly. So wh what we're doing here is confirming the wetland boundaries and saying these boundaries are accurate for the next three years. So if you're, we, we used that to estimate riverfront area, but that was not actually flagged mean annual high water or first observable break and slope in the field. We didn't measure 200 feet off of those points because they weren't placed. We just did our best to estimate where that boundary was. Um, so if you approve it, then that's approving that as the riverfront boundary for the next three years. If you don't, then they would have to 
we would have to have this conversation again if a project came before the board. We would have to review the boundary or figure out how we were going to determine the boundary in the future. And for my opinion, I mean, we've had this discussion. Um, I mean, we haven't been able to come up with sort of a better solution. I appreciate that if we could gain access, but apparently we can't, that would be the, you know, the best way to do it. Um, but, you know, I think we need to move forward at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just, we'll have to go on record one way or the other to say it's accurate that we're approving it or we're excluding it. Um, and then just the other resource areas um, on the plan that you're approving, um, specifically stating if you're approving them or not approving them. Um, we would have to include that in a motion that was made here. So um, bordering vegetated wetlands, isolated wetlands, um, vernal pools, um, I mean, in vernal pools, the isolated wetlands, um, isolated land subject to flooding, which I think Maria has determined there is none on the site. Uh, I don't think that they're, they're including flood areas on this anyways. Um, the, the FEMA floodplain doesn't extend onto the site. There's no FEMA floodplain on the site. No, we, we okay. show that as part of the process if there is. Okay, so that that would not be, you know, we wouldn't be approving that boundary because it's not, not on the site. Um, and then, you know, note whether we're approving riverfront. Um, am, am, I, am I right when I look at the map, it looks to me like the area we're talking about, the potential area with, with the uh, riverfront, is one or two percent of the whole property? Yes, it's it's very small. You can yeah, so just to I put thought. in perspective yeah. what we're talking yeah. about, you can see yeah, the can, center yeah. line. Um, if you can see my screen, the center line, and then we, the two hundred foot offset. Yeah. So you can see it yeah. just hangs over the boundary in a couple places. Yeah, it just it's Wait. filling that rumor that you could stay on Cole's land all the way up to New Hampshire, Vermont. That was the initial, like you could get all the way across. So they needed that little slip right there. <laughs> but you know, we are talking about a, you know, a small part of the property. In terms, when I looked at it and looked at the map in terms of what they can develop, I mean, the place they can develop is the lower part. That upper one, it's not much. Air, you know, anyway, I'm sure if you put in certain things there, like a cell tower or or PV panels, that could go into part of it. But we're not talking about much area in terms of that part relative to the riverfront. Yeah. I, I do think though. So, Brett, is there precedent that's been set regarding these decisions in the past? Precedent? In what sense, Laura? I mean, I mean, like you know, I think that um, we talked, we spoke about it during the last meeting, and obviously we can't. You know, we're limited right now. Um, have there been similar decisions, you know, in the past that are, or similar situations that have arisen like this, or we've taken similar action? You mean, so basing that line off of an estimate? Right. Yeah. Rather than, yeah. I mean, my recollection, I don't know if you know better, Fletcher, but I sort of recollect that we have. I can't think of th something specific. And this was also gone through third party as well, Laura. And okay. my recollection is that um, Stockman had no issues with this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So am I recollecting that correct, Aaron, that um, Emily Stockman had no issues? That's correct. I mean, she, well, she, th that, that line that you're seeing is based on our recommendation um, for the limitations on the site. So that's, that's the best we think it could get without access to the neighboring property. Yep. Okay. Um, so I just want to state as well that there's land underwater is shown on the plan and um, bank flags are also shown on the plan. So um, there are 
many resource areas that would need to be considered or included in an approval um, and maybe what we should do is prior to the board making any motion is just kind of run through what those are and I could list them to make it a little bit easier um, again it's it's the easiest thing is to say all of the boundaries as shown on the plan are approved and just approve them as they are on the plan set that is the easiest thing to do excluding one or the other resource areas when it starts to get a little tricky so it's really up to the board Mm -hmm. as to how to proceed. Yeah, I think that's typically what we do mm -hmm. when appropriate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I'm still gonna leave it to um, see if the commissioners still have more and then uh, we will open up to the public in a second as well. So any other questions from the commission or Aaron, anything that specific that uh, we need to discuss before we ask for pub public comment? I think we addressed the big ones. Yeah, I think we've covered most of the points. I think the big thing is going to be deciding what you want to include in the statement of facts and deciding which resource areas you're going to be approving. Okay. You can cross that bridge when we come to it. Yep. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so and thank you, Aaron, for helping us through that. Thank you, Maria, as well. Um, so I'm going to open it up to public comment now. So if you want to use that little feature to raise your hand, um, either Aaron or I can allow you to make your comments. Okay, so Tim Lang. Uh, okay, so Tim, you should be able to speak at this point. Can you hear me? We can. Um, I have a couple of questions. Mostly, I'm just seeking clarification, trying to figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should just ask them all and then you can answer them if they seem appropriate in the order that makes sense. We okay. will do our best, and if not, remind us. Okay. okay. Um, my first concerns flags versus XY coordinates. And if a boundary, a wetland boundary, is contested, what has the final say? Is it the XY coordinate or is it the flag in the field? Because what bothers me is that flags in the field can move, trees fall down, all sorts of things can happen. And we're talking three years. And so don't we need? absolutely accurate XY coordinates? That's my first. Um, my second, um, I guess, concerns a possible future development. And the land is owned by um, Coles, which was at least at one point a logging company. And I'm wondering, does um, logging require uh, respect of the wetlands? And what is to prevent a logging operation to go in and just running roughshod over all the um, the features that we're trying to um, protect. And then my final question is just, what is the next step forward? Um, if a, a notice of intent comes through, does it go to you or does it go to a different um, part of the uh, local government? Those are my three questions. Okay, thank you, Tim. And we'll do our best to answer them. And again, um, let us know if we miss anything. Okay. Um, so the first one about, I mean, so the flags are, those are the actual things. Do they move? They do. Um, so if we do, if there is movement, then they need to get re-flagged. Um, but and what do you use to re-flag them if you don't have a coordinate? So ideally it's done um, by a wetland scientist. So the same type of person who okay. is flagging it now, they can go out there and flag it again um, is one way to do it. And which which also, means it could change. Correct. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, everything can change. Nothing is perfectly accurate, but um, so Aaron, is that um, accurate? Yes, it, it is, but um, I would say if flagging disappears in the field, which happens quite frequently, that right. flags blow away, then all we have to rely on in a situation like this is the XY coordinate because right. um, this is the approved delineation. The board is agreeing that this is the wetland boundary. And so if we were to go back and have flags replace the XY coordinate would then be used to replace the flagging right. in that situation. So don't but, they have to be accurate? But when, I'm sorry, um, but Aaron, wouldn't they also be looking for what the resource boundary is on the ground at that same time? Well, the resource boundary has already been confirmed. Yeah. so. So it's a good example, and I'll just use the site that we were looking at um, mm -hmm. last at the last meeting, which was the 750 West Street. The site was originally flagged 
the board approved it and then the guy came back asking for an extension and I went out to review the delineation and when I went out there there was no flags for me to see all I could do is say approximately it looks like this is where the old wetland line is and I believe it's expanded um, visual estimate only um, so but if it's an active permit that has an approved flagging system on it, then an XY coordinate would be used to replace that flagging. Um, until that delineation expired or um, a new permit was filed where it was I mean, contested in some way. It seems to me that we're in a modern state where in the past a flag was the, the situation and you couldn't verify where a flag was with realistic coordinates. With a GPS system where you can flag them to an XY coordinate system, that comes back in being a reference in terms of things. Now, I'm not, well, I, I, that doesn't mean that the actual site is the correct site as time changes, but it just does mean that you go back to a better reference than the flag. So, yep, and yeah, GPS coordinates are not, nothing is perfectly precise. Um, no. Yeah, right, yeah, and, but neither is the flag, but neither is the flag. I mean, the guy puts it down or the woman puts it down and they're one foot from where they were gonna do what they do what they started doing. The accuracy is at a point where, anyway. Okay, so Tim, I'm not sure if that's a satisfactory answer for you, but that's the state of knowledge or um, the state of affairs with that one. No, I understand. Related to forestry, that's a separate question. There are state forestry laws out there. And so when they are doing forestry, then they, and assuming that they are removing a certain amount of material, they do have to get their plans approved by the state. And within there, there are something called best management practices. And a lot of those are related to uh, wetlands and other sensitive areas. Um, and, so that is something- that I'll right just there. throw in there. Part of that, Brett, is also the forest cutting plan Mm -hmm. which gets submitted that's the state process that brett was talking about that also gets then we also the conservation commission does get a copy of that as well and we have a 10-day comment period when that plan gets uh, submitted yeah and that has to be approved maybe you just said that that has to get approved by a local service forester i believe yeah Patrick. yeah yeah and so all wet all resource areas need to be mapped for that forest cutting plan um so it's all so there's no running amok really, if, as you say. Yeah, and one thing that's kind of weird about a lot of these, Tim, is these are somewhat agnostic to what's happening on the land right now. Um, you know, we have, there's no proposals in front of us about what they might do with the mm -hmm. land. It's just simply what, where the resource boundaries are. And obviously why people are doing that is for future activities, um, or at least to figure out what the potential future activities could be. And, uh, and where we might argue with them. So that's really, it's also where we might argue with them. It's the idea that we've defined what we think is the correct case. When they come back, we still have the opportunity to evaluate that and including what the plan says. Okay, Tim. So I, I had a feeling I was going to forget the one of those. So what was the third one again? Uh, what would be um, the next step forward? As abutters, as neighbors, what are we looking for next now that the wetlands is perhaps settled. Okay, gotcha. So nothing is settled yet until we sort of vote on it, but um, so a couple of things can happen. If it gets approved tonight, then these are the official boundaries that Coles can work with. Again, we don't know what, if anything, they're gonna do with this land. The next thing that would happen if they are gonna do something with this land is something called an NOI, so notice of intent. At that point, they would submit this back to our commission um, because of the wetland issues. And they would have to do another abutter notice. So at that point, they would have to, you know, I'm sure that's how you found out about this. So you would get another notice. It would get back on our docket. And then we would start, not this whole process again, but yeah, there would be public hearings and we'd have to approve it. And we'd have to talk about what's going on. But at that point, these wetland boundaries, once they're approved, those are kind of moot. Those are what we said we agreed to um, at that point. Does that make sense, Tim? Uh, yeah, so to make sure I have this, this right, it would come to you next, not to planning and zoning. It depends on what, we will get something in front of us if it has a potential to influence the wetlands. 
it somewhat depends on what they're planning to do with it, Tim, what the other, what other boards would need. So I don't know if Dave or Aaron would know better um, about the other boards. I apologize, Tim. I just know about ours. Okay. Can, can I jump in really quickly, Brett? So, um, unless Aaron or Dave wants to come in first, but no. Okay, I, Maria, please. I, I was just going to say they're, they're going to have to go through planning board regardless and in either case, um, whether it be through planning board or the conservation commission that abutters have to receive notice like you did for this application. Oh, thank you, Maria. So. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tim. So any, so we have a number of other people um, here from the public. Does anybody else have a comment or a question that they'd like to raise at this point? I'm just kind of raise your hand. Okay, so I'm not, oops. <laughs> so as soon as you think, okay, uh, did he, did he, did he? there we go. Um, Jenny, so you should be able to speak at this point. Nope, let's try again. There you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay, how about now? Yes, yeah. we can hear you now. Okay, great. We've talked about uh, the difficulty in asking for reflagging, going out the expense. I'm wondering if Aaron or somebody could explain what would be involved in doing a survey so that we would have X, Y points as a result of survey. So how does survey and reflagging uh, relate in terms of the size of the project? I mean, so surveying would be even more expensive and more time consuming uh, if that was what the question is. So, I mean, we'd have to get, they'd have to get professional surveyors out there. They'd have to get their equipment up, set up all of their control points and then start. Yeah, it would be a much more time consuming um, endeavor. And that that's what the question was. Accurate, as I understand. Would that have been the most accurate X, Y points? Sure. Yep, surveying is definitely the most accurate method that we have available to us. Correct. Well, but it still it still requires a decision. I mean, surveying somebody's got to make a decision of where that survey point is. But yes, that will give you a more accurate X Y coordinate, but not necessarily a wetlands decision. Right, because they're not wetland scientists. Is that right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Well, they're just identifying where the flags are. That's right. Yeah. Only so going still, go, still go back to the flags and what the accuracy is in those. But they could do it with like, you know, a very, very high level of precision. Um, True. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, is easily, I assume. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, anybody else from the public have any comments before I bring it back to the commission and we'll figure out how we want to move forward? Okay, so not hearing any at this point. So commissioners, now it is back in our hands. Um, <laughs> and so we've had this one in front of us for a while. Um, yep. We've had third party review that was very thorough, extremely helpful. Um, we've had the detailed responses to it. Um, there's a couple of outstanding issues that Aaron raised. So I think we need, or we do need to address those. Um, Anything else that we need to sort of hash out? Is it really just, um, Aaron, would you mind putting up that, your, your uh, presentation there? Are those the outstanding issues that we need to hash out? Um, yes, let me get my yep. uh, presentation back up. Um, so I think the question is, um, are you comfortable approving all resource areas? That's question number one. That's, that's really what the ORAD is, is are you approving all of the resource areas? Are you only approving certain resource areas? Um, from my perspective, I think that the board is, is being very conservative to approve all resource areas in this case. I think that that is completely fine. We've had a peer reviewer give us recommendations. We've walked the site, she's walked the site multiple times. We've reviewed um, revisions multiple times. So I don't think 
I think that you're you are on safe grounds to approve the delineation for all resource areas on the plan at this point. Um, I think from my perspective, the the you know you as a board just need to make sure you're comfortable with that estimated riverfront boundary as we've recommended and that's really the main the main question at this point as far as that is concerned um, and then the finding of facts that I would recommend we attach to the ORAD and specifically what we would want to state in that because um, we will look at that when we go to issue an extension or if a notice of intent comes before the board and um, my recommendation would be that f at a minimum flags be replaced in the field with the revised flagging system prior to an extension being issued or prior to um, a notice, an order of conditions being issued. I would say that would be my bare minimum recommendation if the board wants to require those to be placed or um, shown on a surveyed plan, that's at the commission's discretion. Um, and then the vernal pools, I would recommend that they um, be treated as though they're certified and that hopefully we can continue to pursue certification with coals to kind of can it up. Erin, I thought that we already had both sets of flagging numbers on plans though. Uh, maybe there's something I missed when you said we should get, we have the option to get the new ones on a survey plan. I thought we already had that. There We've got the XY there, coordinates. We have the XY coordinates. We have them shown on a plan, but they're not, they're not survey grade flags. Okay. That so was just the point surveyed. I was making. I consider that sort of a survey. I thought that was a survey plan, what we were looking at. Not that they were surveyed, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, th I think I agree with everything that Aaron had mentioned about just um, approving all resource areas. We did, um, if that was our recommendation to estimate, to estimate riverfront area, I say we go for that. Um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, um, the one thing is I don't think we need to get a uh, vernal pool certified, but as long as we make sure that those vernal pools are identified on the plans as is, and we're going to treat them like they're certified. I don't, I don't think we need to go through the process of getting them certified as long as they're documented on the plan. Then we treat them as vernal pools, like we treat every vernal pool that we comes in front of us. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. It would be nice to get them certified, though, just for for nothing else, for perpetuity. Uh, I appreciate. Can we? Yeah, but so, but from Shane's response, so we. I mean, uh, Aaron, you pretty much asked that. Yeah, it's not going to impact this order, though. It's, it's not, not going right. to impact this at all. That's a so separate like, sidebar conversation. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. we're going to treat it like that anyway. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I'll definitely pursue it and see, you know, and then we can make a decision from there if we want to try to move forward with certification with or without permission um, from the landowner. But I'll leave that to the board to decide once they give us a decision. Yeah, let's just treat them like they're just they're vernal pools. They're mapped. Yep. Yes, we got them. They're already there. Yep, Unless good. Larry changes them. This ORAD is in place. We're good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Fletcher, it sounds like you're on board with what's here. Uh, I'm with you with what was said as well. Um, what about other commissioners? Any oh, feeling? I agree. Nope, I agree. I agree. I agree. Okay, um, so we're looking for a brave soul to step up and try and summarize uh, what this motion will be. So I can I can help here. Um, I just want to clarify one point: is there was a question about whether the board wanted the flags surveyed in the future or not. Just want to make sure I'm clear if everyone's in agreement. Is that in agreement that flags do or don't need to be surveyed in the future? survey grade yeah in my opinion they they absolutely need to be surveyed grade in the future yes so we're saying so then what's that saying that we're in it's order to move forward this has to be surveyed 
No, no, no it's no, it's no. it's saying just, if if they come back with an extension before we would issue okay. an extension yeah, or right. before an order of conditions was issued that they would need to be surveyed the, the flag locations I mean, the other option areas we could say nothing on that as well you mm -hmm. you could i think you could the, the point i argue about the surveying like flags is the flags may not be right in five years or three years oh, right that's a separate issue but yeah, yeah maybe in larry it might be a bigger issue but it is a separate issue yes mm -hmm. I don't okay. know. Maybe I'm just so, feeling. Yes. Yeah. I like okay. the idea of maybe not saying anything about it. Okay. All right. So we, we, we prefer that too. <laughs> not that our opinion matters. Actually, I disagree. Be off the commission by then, so what we're. Yeah. Doing. No, actually, <laughs> I, I I do disagree. I mean, I think that I have to say that, um, and perhaps I I missed it on our last uh, meeting, but I I I was actually um, surprised that this was done by GPS. Um, and so, and, and perhaps that was my misunderstanding from our last uh, meeting that we had on this exact topic. So, um, you know, that was, you know, that was a, a surprise to me in this, in this meeting. So I actually, um, I actually, so, you know, I will, I agree on everything else, but I, I, I don't agree on that point. Um, if there is a, I, I want to be um, crystal clear that if there is an extension request that, um, you know, a physical survey uh, should be required here. So, like, I just um, of all of our the everything that comes from not just this other um, other plans and everything, everything, all wetland delineation, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, come from GPS points. How how often do we see surveyed wetland points come in front of us? I don't usually it's recall. when an engineered plan yeah. comes before us. Okay, so, so, it's, so it's, but like, a plan like a design. Ward Smith's not doing it or like a, um, Chuck Dotchie's not doing it. No, but, right? but, but, but right. I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm just looking for clarifications all. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. Um, Fletcher, but I think, and, and maybe this is a, this is a good distinction to make actually mm -hmm. is that if an order of conditions is issued that it should be stamped by a registered land surveyor, engineer, architect, mm -hmm. landscape okay. architect. Um, if an order of conditions is issued, the plan needs to be um, uh, stamped by one of those individuals gotcha. and that the flag locations need to be surveyed in those instances because what you're saying is 100% is correct. And that's exactly why I'm bringing this up because if, if an engineered plan comes forward, it's gonna be important that those flag locations be surveyed. surveyed. But yeah in the case of an ORAD extension, it might not be as essential. So maybe that's a good distinction to make in the statement of facts. Yeah, I mean, that all feels and sounds like just standard stuff they're always dealing with. So Fletcher, I like they sort of put it in context. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm with you, Laura, once it reaches a certain stage, it will need to get surveyed. At this point, personally, I'm okay kind of being moot on it or mute on it, I should say. So, but yeah, that doesn't push our decision in the future one way or the other. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess as long as Aaron is existing as kind of history keeper on that motion, because like Brett, like you said, if you are not on the commission at that point, depending on when it comes forward, um, I think that's my only concern about it not being in writing is depending on how long this project goes, if it, comes back around and everyone's like, oh, I don't know, like, seems fine, whatever, um, then kind of losing that, that effort and that work that we've, we've put into kind of considering the importance of that. And so I'm a little wary of, of just leaving all of this kind of conversation that we've had out um, regarding future plans. Well, I think that's just a standard thing that we always expect though, Anna. I mean, I think that we would expect anything that came back to the f us into the future with an engineering plan yeah. would be surveyed. Yeah, it's like yeah. gotta be. And okay. I, think, I think perhaps that Anna and I are responding to the fact that there have been a number of, um, uh, you know, agenda items that we've reviewed in, in the recent past where there was history that wasn't necessarily recorded and we were all kind of guessing of, oh, well, what was the intention here? And why did we let that, you know, you know, not, not to call out specific instances, but, um, you know, that, that's one of my, uh, 
uh, sort of driving forces as well. Yeah, I mean, if we want to say something along those lines related to that distinction, particularly that um, Fletcher helps with, yeah, I'm fine with that. I think that's standard practice, but I'm fine having if it, that. If it's standard practice and we can clarify that we want to maintain that standard practice, then I'm comfortable with that. Does that make sense what we said, Aaron, in language that I can't quite see what you're typing, but does that make sense in language that you can translate? Yes, yes. Um, it's our rambling conversation. Yes, and so um, I just want to kind of paraphrase back what you guys just said to make sure I can um, s create the statement of fact to accurately reflect the record. Um, so my understanding is um, that you would like the site to be reflagged with the revised flagging system prior to an order of resource area delineation being um, issued or prior to an order of conditions being issued that vernal pools on the site um, that have been identified on the plan be treated as certified and that in the future um, should a um, an engineer um, a project come before the board that requires engineering that the flagging be surveyed and that the stamps should be or the plans should be stamped by a registered engineer landscape architect um, architect surveyor etc as would be standard practice that all sounds good to me and that sounds accurate okay great Thanks. so um, I just put up on the screen this is basically what the approval looks like on the ORAD form. So um, the motion would essentially be that the board was approving the um, delineation on the most recent submitted plan set as accurate. Um, and that would include the bordering vegetated wetlands, riverfront, isolated vegetated wetlands, vernal pools, isolated land subject to flooding, land underwater, um, and bank, and then see also attached statement of fact that we referenced. Okay. Okay, so are we good for a motion then? So, sorry, I'm not allowed to make it, so. It's my excuse. Convenient, isn't it? Easy enough. Can I just say so moved? Pull Larry here. As long as I hear a second. Was that you saying it? So moved. Can I oh. say that? Are we good with that? Uh, we're gonna, um, I'd like to make a motion to accept all resource areas. Um, I lost all right, second. It. So, okay. I couldn't so, tell where the motion started and ended. Sorry, Fletcher. It didn't go any, or actually it really just said so move, it didn't really start or end. <laughs> so the motion is to approve or to move forward with what Aaron stated earlier uh, at that last, that last piece. Okay, so Fletcher, how do you vote? Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. Larry. Aye. And I from me as well. So I think we are good with this one. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so Maria, I'm sure you and Aaron will be in touch about um, paperwork and all that sort of stuff. So. Thanks again. I know that this was a lot of work on everyone's part. So thanks for all the time that went into it. Okay, thank you, thank you Maria. And thank you to everybody from the public who participated. Um, thank you for sticking with it. Thank you for the questions. Um, again, as we, through Tim's question, we don't know what's happening with this property next. If something does happen, then a notice of intent will come through. So it's all we can say. Okay, so that was really the only, uh, you know, um, that was the big agenda item that we had. And then there was the two potential administrative ones. So the one for 55 Lilac and then Aspen Heights. Can I, yeah. can I comment on the last thing? So. Can I comment on the last thing? 
Uh, the motion has already went through, but besides that, you're more than welcome to comment, Larry. Yeah, well, I, well I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put my my point on what I was arguing about, and that is that a surveyor is not a wetlands evaluator, and the surveyor okay. goes back to identify points that might be by a flag, and could be an error, and they don't know how to make a decision with respect to that. So my concern about this whole thing has to do with inconsistency of a surveyor versus a wetlands identifier. So we go out and a wetlands person goes out and puts the flag in. If that person at the same time makes a GPS coordinate or does a GPS coordinate, that becomes a record of sorts. And if the surveyor goes back to the record or goes back to the flag, it's a different situation. And you know, six months or six years from now, GPS could come down to two inches. So I, I'm concerned with, we're getting hung up on things relative to this. I do believe we've got to evaluate them, but I'm concerned about this aspect about surveyors versus the wetlands coordinator. Okay. Yeah. So all valid points. Thank you, Larry. Okay. Um, so unless there's anything else, is it okay if we move on to Lilac? Go. Oh. Um, yeah, can, can I just um, quickly run through some um, other business um, and I will d try to g get through these as quickly as possible. Um, okay, that is fine. So. so I just wanted to let you guys know that um, in the last week I issued um, the three outstanding determinations, the two outstanding orders of conditions. We do have still have two outstanding permits, which is 152 Logtown. Um, which I think went to Laura for a signature. Um, and I'm just awaiting getting the permit back with wet signature so I can issue. Um, and then the one that was just approved at the last meeting, I still have to get that one out, but um, been catching up, which is great. And so um, just with that one, so Laura, you received that and that's back in the mail at this point? I don't know if we lost Laura. She's on mute. Oh no, she's still there. Uh, we can't hear you, Laura, if you're trying to speak. Okay. Well, my, my recollection is I dropped all those signable things off at her house last week. Okay. You know, the, the, the packet that was circulating, mm -hmm. yep. I dropped off at her house. I didn't okay. mail it because the mailing thing was getting ridiculous in terms of the packaging. Yeah, so, sorry about that, Larry. All the yes, humidity stuck that's everything that's together, and I had to, like, Make some that's serious okay. concoction I, there. It was pretty good though, huh? Yeah, but I wanted to go up there and look at the area again anyway. So I figured that was a good reason for me to go up there and I dropped it off at her house. I dropped it off with her husband. Okay, I was just hoping that Laura has that. I just want to see where that's at, but okay, we'll find out. Yeah, I can follow up. Um, okay, so we've got done P the Haskins, Shootsbury Road. Okay, so we have actually four requests for minor administrative changes. Um, and some of these I think we can burn through pretty quickly. Um, and one of them I don't think is can be approved tonight. Um, <laughs> Aspen Heights. Um, Aspen Heights is just a it's a uh, just a sewer line adjustment um, that's already been approved by DPW. So I'm not super. No, I was trying to read through the emails about it. And okay. It like it's... Um, so let's start with Lilac Lane. Um, so um, you guys might remember um, this project. It was um, late yep. in the year last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. They pulled out a fence, um, made some drainage improvements, um, and basically what they want to do, they have an existing determination of applicability, but they wanted to install um, a new fence. And so um, this, this um, application was submitted showing the, um, the approximate old fence line location that they had and the new fence line that they are requesting. Um, and I just wanna check my email really quickly because... Did anybody else download this file? And because when I opened it, the lines didn't show up and I thought I was really bad at reading maps because I could not figure out where the fence was trying to go. 
I had the same problem. I couldn't see the figure she just showed. The figure that she just showed is, is delineative. You can figure out what's happening, but the stuff that I got, I couldn't read it like you. Yeah, okay. I so that's just what I saw, that kind of stuff. Yep, yep. I wasn't sure if I had the wrong file or if something happened on download, right. but just wanted to let you know, Erin. Um, yeah, she, she provided a bunch of these marked up PDFs, yeah. and I think that's what the problem was. Um, they were just... Um, little funky as far as formatting was concerned. Um, I asked her for a approximate distance of the proposed fence from the wetland and so that's what these green lines are. Shows the setback of the fence from the existing wetland. Um, so she's just asking basically for the commission to kind of grant her permission to replace the fence in the new location. Um. Oh, sorry, we're gonna keep going. I think that, that it's fine. If you guys have ever been to this site, if you look at topography, they're on top. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that slope goes pretty far down and long right. down to that marsh. Cause I yeah. walked that trail. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't see any issue. I'm, I agree. That's, nice. I that's agree. nice that she asked. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have any issues with this as well. Yeah. And Aaron, this is the one where they are planning to basically replace it with a lake fence as well similar height or something um i think that it was previously a chain link fence and they're doing like a stockade fence um for the replacement um mm -hmm. so it's a slightly different style of fence but they did finish i believe all of the work that yeah. was um associated with the rda besides the fence replacement so just to give you a sense of what it looks like now because they took the, the pool out, they um, put an addition on, they, they did some drainage improvements, and they put in a retaining wall. Yeah, they improved the site big time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have In terms no of erosion control. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think that we necessarily need a motion, but if there's a consensus that the board is okay with this, then that's fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. I am good. All right. Um, let me move on to the next item. Okay, so the next item is Aspen Heights. Um, and this one is an order of conditions, so we definitely would need a motion because this would be a um, minor amendment to the order. Um, so this is the re oh, is this right? Wait, hold on just one second, sorry. Okay. Um, so request for a, um, minor amendment to the order of conditions that was issued for the Amherst Housing Project 408 Northampton Road. Um, existing conditions is a six inch water pipe that was connected to the water main at Route 9. Um, they're looking to um, abandon a portion of it. So the modification is to remove this section within the town right of way. And this is abandoning basically an old um, uh, water line. Um, and it, this is a requirement of the town for the project because, um, you know, they're putting in a new water line. So they have to remove the old, the location of the old water line. And so DPW has already approved this. Um, allow removal of water main located in the town right of way is basically all they're seeking permission to do. And I did talk to Guilford about this and Guilford said he wouldn't sign on the permit, but he said that the town has given permission through its permitting process to allow work on this utility. So I don't have any problem with this. Yep. Seems like a good thing to get the old pipe out, so. Yeah. Yep, I agree. 
And so you're saying that we, or anybody have any comments or questions on this one? Seems fairly benign. Yeah, so this would be a, um, I would ask for a motion um, approving a minor amendment to the order of conditions for Aspen Heights. So I motion to approve this minor, oh, we just said it. Administrative. Minor administrative change for Aspen Heights. Second. Okay, so Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Laura. I don't know if we lost Laura or not. I don't so, hear, sir. I just couldn't find my own. <laughs> so, Laura, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. Larry? Aye. And then I for me. And yes, so I don't think we ever got Leroy back. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Sorry. All right, so. So these these are actually one in the same Aspen Heights and 408 Northampton Road. Okay, so Mountain View Circle, this one's a little more of a can of worms um, and I don't think that the board can approve it. I already spoke with um, Bob Predmore. Um, and I, I'm going to have to talk with him a little bit more, but I'll show you the plan um, and just get the board's general opinion on this um, to make sure that you guys are kind of in agreement with my perspective um, or what your perspective is. Feel free to, um, to let me know. So um, you may recall that Bob had a has, uh, I think it's Plum Brook that flows through his property and there's a failed culvert behind his property which floods regularly mm -hmm. and he he had to do some improvements on his property um, because of a failed septic system to connect to the town water and sewer um, and so he had like a phased approach for his order of conditions um, to to connect to town water and sewer uh, or connect to town sewer and then um, he was proposing to pull out this culvert and do some stream restoration work. And then the final phase of the project was to um, replace his driveway once the stream restoration was complete. He completed the first phase, which was the sewer line. And then he has been held up with the um, stream restoration portion because of the cost. And um, mostly because the contractors that he has hired to try to do the stream restoration work um, that the cost has been over ten thousand dollars to to do the just the pump around and the engineering for the pump around of the stream while the construction goes on so um, Bob was previously um, I believe a landscape architect he's he's very skilled with um, you know his um, his illustrations and he came up with this proposal basically and that his proposal is on the right to um, create a new stream channel that's immediately adjacent to the existing stream channel that would serve as essentially um, create a new channel stabilize it and then um, once it's stabilized allow the stream to flow through that new stream channel so that he could go in and pull out the old um, culvert um, from looking at his plans, I don't think this is permissible through this process. He's asking for a minor amendment for this work. And from where I sit, this is creating quite a bit more um, resource alteration and that it could only really be done through a new notice of intent, not even through an official amendment process. But I did tell him that I would present this to the board. I gave him the option to be here this evening. I don't know if he's on the call, but these are all things that I told him over the phone today. And I spoke to, oh, he is on. Um, and he's raised his hand to speak, um, what, Brett's. What, was his intent to restore it after the uh, culvert was repaired? 
Um, his intent is to... Or is to leave it permanently that way. I think his intent is to pull the culvert out, but he could probably speak to that. No, but, um, but after he pulls the culvert, takes the culvert, is he going to restore the street the way it was? I don't think so. I think the intent is to keep the new um, channel that he designs. And I think that that's because that is where it's overflowing currently um, when there's a flood. I think that's the area where the stream is flowing over land and back into itself because the culvert has completely failed. Yep. And so, yeah, we do have Bob online. So I don't know if Bob, if you'd like to add something at this point. Yes, I would like to add something and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I've been working on this now. I've owned the property four years and I've been working on this particular improvement for four years. Uh, I have a, a very small window, uh, three months, and uh, I'm trying to get started. Uh, the numbers that I've been getting are three times what I have uh, to do the work. And part of the problem is the pump around. And what we're proposing, and I've discussed this with the engineer, uh, is that instead of a pump around, we just allow the existing culvert, which is perfectly fine as long as there's not a, a tremendous amount of uh, flow uh, runoff coming, coming down the stream. Uh, and we, if you, if you see the, uh, the plan on the left, that plan, and it's kind of hard to see, but that is the approved uh, channel location uh, for th the new uh, daylighted stream. Uh, the sketch that I did this morning on the right simply flips that existing alignment opposite hand and it moves it south a little bit, just really a few feet. I mean, uh, and it allows us to use the culvert as a gravity bypass. We can, we can grade and uh, stabilize the banks and do everything uh, and have it all ready to go. And then we could actually abandon the, the existing culvert. We, we could remove the head walls and stop the, uh, uh, block the culvert at both ends. And it's a simple, quick, easy fix. It would allow me to proceed with the resources that I have right now. Uh, I, I refinanced my house. Uh, I got $45,000 out. I did $15,000 worth of sewer work. I've got $30,000. I have two proposals for $30,000 if I uh, if I'm allowed to use the gravity bypass. So that, that's really the, the, what I would like to do is have a pre-construction meeting on the site as soon as possible and start work. Uh, otherwise, I think I'm gonna miss the, this year and I'm gonna have the flooding for a fifth year, which is pretty exasperating, honestly. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, You're so welcome. You're definitely in a tough situation there. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a pretty major change to the original one. And so it's not that it's any better or worse, but it's yeah, pretty substantial from what was originally there is the problem for us. Um, so commissioners, thoughts, ideas? Sorry, when was this last, when was this first one submitted? Um, it was approved prior to my arrival. I, um, I remember it. Let me see. It was Hold last on. September. Last September. Yeah. I remember going out there. There's a really nice field on the other side of the stream. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that totally floods. Um, how can we help? But we, we can't just, that's a big change, huh? It's too big of a change. It looks like a big change, but it's, yeah. it's, it's moving the proposed uh, stream channel a few feet south into that big field. Uh, and it's leaving the culvert in place. That's, that's the change. It, it actually uh, minimizes the impact. Of the, uh, You're moving a few feet? 
only a few feet. That's right. What is it? What is a few? I can't see it. It's, it, it, it's less than five feet. Okay, I, I can't see in the figure, so it's kind of hard at, at, my, at my station to be able to look at that that way. Yeah, the scale is difficult to see. Um, I think it might be one to 20 feet, but I, this the, might the be- The scale is one, one to five feet. It's a very large scale. It's almost oh, okay. a, is an this kind of like that, that, does this, so this could, is this potentially, an, this is gonna be an improvement to the resource? Because we're now, not going to be using it, it. I'm just saying this. This proposal would not be using the culvert anymore, right? We we get rid of the culvert, and so exactly. now that's the that's the proposal today. We're like going to have a right. Some yeah, I don't. Well, either proposal Fletcher is to get rid of the culvert if hell comes out. Correct. So yeah. So the other complicating factor with this is um, because this is natural heritage endangered species area, and so. Oh, amen. Um, That's it. you know, natural heritage would need to, you know, buy into this proposal as well. And I don't necessarily, I don't think that this is a bad proposal. Um, I don't think sure. that what Bob is proposing to do is, is bad in any way. I just think that it's difficult from our position to approve it in this manner because, um, there's additional resource alteration that's proposed and we can't account for it. And, um, I'm not even sure that this could be done through a standard amendment where butters are notified. It's just that dramatic of a change to the original mm. proposal. Yeah, I mean, this kind of sucks, Bob, because I understand, yeah, timing and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, our, I'm with our, our, our sympathy is there. The question is whether it's legitimate to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, unless somebody can convince me otherwise, I'm with it. You know, I'm sitting where Aaron is too. I mean, this is a pretty, I realize it's only a few feet, but um, it's a pretty dramatic difference in my mind. Yeah, and even though it's a positive change, it's not necessarily a minor administrative one, which is the. Right. Yeah. Is there any way that, um, and I probably work with these people in the same office, but um, contact, or maybe this is up for you, Bob. Uh, contacting natural heritage. I don't know, Aaron, would this work? Like run it by them to see if they can look at a fast track way and like, hey, that looks okay to us. We actually, maybe there's like a letter of support or is this just not, it's going beyond precedent here. Yeah, no, I, um, I don't know. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. And that's, you know, initially when I talked with Bob, that was kind of what I was thinking was maybe we could do it in this fashion. But once I saw the plan, I was like, ooh, I'm not sure that, um, I think any entity that saw this would say a new permit needs to be filed. Um, I mean, we, we could certainly get comments if Bob wanted to run it by them, get comments from them. Um, I could, you know, pass it by Mark Stinson um, over like a Zoom call and see what he said as far as what he would recommend. But I mean, my recommendation to Bob on this would be to file a new notice of intent to do it. And I know that's costly and i know it's more time um but i feel like it might be the only way that we could legally approve this but so what sort of timeline are we talking about here aaron so i mean what's a reasonable length of time that bob might think about if he did want to do this as new noi i think um if he he has his plan ready to go and he either wanted to fill out the the permit application on his own. It would be um, requesting a butter notifications, um, notifying abutters of the proposal, and notifying Natural Heritage of the proposal, and then we would post the legal ad. So the cost associated with the legal ad, which is anywhere from 100 to two, you know, 150 or so dollars to post um, the cost of the NOI filing, which I'd have to look at that a little bit more closely to see what what um, category it would fall under. Um, but I think it's possible that it could be filed as a resource area improvement, in which case we might be able to get a lower application fee, but I think he'd still have to go through that application process. If he could pull it together quickly, I think, you know, 
maybe a month or two, he might be able to, you know, get a hearing before the board and have this considered. But I know that that's not on the timeline that he wants. Okay. And then that well, also is contingent upon natural heritage reviewing it in that time period as well. Right. I'm also exactly. thinking about like with natural heritage there, you could just, you know, if it sounds like Bob, this is, we're going to have to go the NOI route, but um, give them a early heads up. I don't know if we can give an email to them too and say like, hey, Amherst Concom, we like this project. We just want to give you a heads up. It's coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one step out of this many multiple process here, but. Yeah. I've I mean, done that with permitting with them before too. It's like, hey, heads up. Yeah, I mean, I've seen this culvert. I, I recognize that this situation needs repair or removal immediately. It's unsafe. Um, I mean, I think it's a public safety issue at this point. Can we point. go that route? I mean. What's an emergency? That's interesting. Yeah. Cert? I mean, the thought has crossed my mind, but it would need to be something that was deemed an immediate threat to public health or safety. And then right. we would need a public entity to order such. So it would probably, you know, we could have Jason Skeels look at it maybe and say, is this a public safety issue? Um, or wait until it floods. I hate to say that, but um, you know, if, if Mr. Predmore's home was in danger, then, um, <laughs> that's another reason to consider this an emergency in which case they could literally just rip the culvert right out and hey i'd rather not wait to, to that extreme dangerous level. Hey, right. just exploring options right <laughs> um, I, do, I do think the angle of public safety is actually a good one um yeah not necessarily like delaying until you know the event happens but yeah no I Bob agree. has documentation here and Bob's has a plan here and that's yeah hmm. well I don't know I have maybe no maybe I could ask if Jason Skeels would be willing to look at it I mean he is he is the town engineer and this is private property so I don't know the implication of that is Dave still on the call Dave Z still on with us no he's not he's not Okay. It's like you're calling Daisy. Daisy, never mind. Um, but maybe we could. Mm. Maybe I could try to, you know, talk to Natural Heritage, reach out to Jason, and see <clears throat> if there's any other avenues that we could explore. Right, because this is like we have a great opportunity here. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And I, mm. this culvert is is a disaster. And it's not helping the resource area at all that it's in there. I'm just not sure we can permit moving the stream channel in this right. fashion. Next, I mean, the easier thing would be to just somehow, yeah, just get that out and let it be in its current channel. So. Right. Yeah, Bob, you have a comment? Uh, I'd just like to point out that the proposed new channel actually relocates it away from the, the culvert. Uh, Jason is very familiar with this uh, uh, situation because part of what has undermined the culvert head walls is uh, drainage that comes from Mountain View Circle from the cul-de-sac. And I've been working with Guilford uh, Mooring for the past four years to try to, 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 try to get him to uh, correct that situation because it has also added to the erosion of the, the head wall. The water comes all the way down. When they, when they flush the hydrant up at the cul-de-sac, the water comes all the way down and goes over the top around the, the side of the culvert head wall. So the town knows about this. They, they're very aware of it. Jason's been out here. They, they, uh, they know what the situation is and uh, they're, they're part of the problem and they have been for years and mm. uh, I've been trying to work with them. I, I've submitted three separate engineering drawings for improvements to the cul-de-sac and uh, I, I've uh, also lobbied my neighbors to help with the drainage up there. So yeah. I've, I've been doing everything reasonable. It would be a very significant 
improvement to uh, Plum Brook to have to have this obstruction removed from the site. And uh, you know, I I have a great engineer working on this with me, STV, uh, Tony uh, Wanseski, and uh, you know, it, it, it's. Not anything that's going to get done again this year. If I have to go uh, file another NOI and go to another public hearing, believe me, uh, if I get started the middle of this month, I can have the bank stabilized with planting by October. Uh, I can't go beyond September 31st because of time of year restrictions. So I'm, I'm right. already half a month through the window of opportunity here. So if if we're not going to go, then you know it's going to be another year of exasperate. And believe me, I've spent thousands of dollars uh, on these plans, and I, to not be able to proceed with it because I have somebody who uh, you know wants to charge six figures to do a, a forty feet of culvert uh, removal. No, I can't. I can't afford. It. I'm I'm retired. I'm on fixed income. I've blown my savings and I've refinanced my home. I'm trying to do this, but uh, it just seems like it's it, it very, very difficult. Yeah, we're sympathetic and I wish, you know, we're trying to figure out what we can do. I mean, yeah, through a administrative thing, that's just not within our purview, unfortunately, Bob, that's just not legal from our perspective. Um, the only short-term thing is, yeah, potentially asking Jason Steele to see if he can if he considers this to be a public threat or a public um, hazard. You know, besides that, unfortunately, Bob, I think this would be another, it would be a new NOI. I hate to say that, but I don't see what other options we have available. Sorry. I mean, if, if Jason deemed this a public safety issue, mm -hmm. then um, maybe that would give us some flexibility to to come up with a emergency response. Is the, the stream is still flowing right now, Bob? Yes. Is it really low flow right now? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, I don't know. It's really coming down pretty hard out Probably there. Probably flashed yeah. pretty good just a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, <true>. exactly. <laughs> South Amherst said a lot of rain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we should table this. I hate to say table this, but I think we need to table it and explore some other options and see. Maybe um, we can brainstorm. So, Aaron, are you going to be reaching out to Jason on this on the issue? Yeah, I can. I can reach out to Jason next week um, and see what his thoughts are. Kind of go over the dilemma. What other, is, what other creative ideas can we have? Yeah, I mean, I guess, is there a reason why we're waiting to next, till next week to reach out to Jason? Aaron knowing he works so many hours a week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm only 20 hours and today was a 10 hour day. Um, so Friday, I come in and I'm only there for three hours. Um, I knew there was a reason, I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, the alternative would be Bob can reach out directly, I would think, as well. Yes. Um, well, does he know what he has to do to do that? I mean, make it sure sounds like he already has. I mean, I guess my question is, uh, Bob. Different Maury knows about it. For, for the for the culvert removal, I know you're getting some exorbitant estimates, and you keep talking about the bypass, the the pump bypass. It sounds like is the is the um, factor that makes this impossible for you to implement because of the cost associated with it. Do you have to have a pump bypass? Well, you can't- a Natural heritage um, like condition or something? You can't dewater the stream. I mean, fair. <laughs> oh, you can't. Um, <laughs> like essentially what they would do is put up like a coffer dam and then right. get a pump and then pump right. on the downhill side. Um, but I mean, I'm wondering if there might be some alternative to that, like if we could put up a turbidity curtain on the downhill side while it's being pulled out to allow the turbidity to settle out of the stream. Um, and maybe that would be a way to get the culvert out without having to do a bypass pump um, if the bypass pump is the financially 
if the what's inhibiting the work being done um, but I think we need to talk about all options on this um, because that might be easier for the Commission to approve as a minor amendment than reconfiguring the stream channel yeah so I mean is that something that the board would be willing to consider a minor administrative change is to do a turbidity curtain instead of a pump around just to kind of explore that well, what is that what does that mean as far as, far as he's concerned what it means is that instead of blocking the stream and pumping the flow through a pipe it would mean that they would put up probably like some sandbags and a turbidity curtain which would yeah. um, hold back the flow a little bit in such a way that it would allow the water to um, the sediment laden water to be held back and filter through a curtain so that water that would come out on the other side would be cleaner but it wouldn't be the same as doing a pump around but it is might that be more is that a temporary fix while they're doing things it, it's temporary while they pull the the culvert yeah, okay. out that, that, and once that. the culvert is out then they could take the turbidity yeah, yeah, curtain yeah. down and just allow the stream flow to reestablish. because mm -hmm. i assume it's pretty quick to pull out the culvert once they're in there right well that's what i'm wondering as well and i don't hear bob on the call right now i, I, I i'm here uh I don't know if everyone really uh, understands that uh, the proposal is to daylight the stream in a channel that's very, very similar to, to uh, it, it doesn't follow the same course as, as the uh, culvert. Uh, it actually cuts across uh, where the water goes when it spills over the, the the head wall. So yeah. there is a, the proposal, uh, the approved plan shows the uh, Plum Brook Channel relocated uh, uh, to the south of the existing head wall. In fact, it goes, it goes, clears the head wall entirely. So, yeah, but so that, that is the proposal. So what I was suggesting was a, what I thought was a minor reconfiguration of the of the channel but i can what, see that it doesn't really work out that way what do you think about what aaron said about the the uh, what she su suggested in terms of the temporary fix to get the culvert out what do you what do you think about that well w what i was hoping by staying clear of the culvert was that i was going to be able to abandon it in place uh that that was what one of the cost reductions. Uh, yeah. Uh. So kind of similar to what um, what the commission did down at um, Owens Pond, where the the pond outlet goes through the spillway, and then we allowed Eversource to create that new stream channel um, outlet for the pond on Wentworth Farm. And then that section of stream was essentially abandoned where the old outlet was. And, and so, it, so you're saying we would have to get a new notice of intent to be able to go that route? Or is there a way we can get around to that approach without doing something like that? The approach that Bob is suggesting would require a new notice of intent gotcha. from my perspective. Unfo I mean, gotcha. unfortunately, I don't gotcha. make the rules, yeah. but <laughs> I know. Gotcha. I just wanted to understand that part of it. <laughs> that's, that's well, uh, it, it, if I can uh, try to wrap this up here, I, I appreciate all the time you folks are spending on it. Uh, I will make a call to Jason uh, tomorrow and uh, ask him to come down and take a look at the uh, the head walls. You know, I, I have a five-year-old granddaughter that lives here with me, and uh, public safety is a, an important part of it. My mm -hmm. basement floods a couple of inches of water when there's when it when it's at peak flow, and uh, so there there are public health and safety aspects of it. I'll ask Jason to take a look at it 
and to get back to uh, Aaron. In the meantime, I'll try to brainstorm with my engineer uh, to see if there's some way I can work with the plan since it seems like, you know, if I could come up with uh, some more money, uh, that might, you know, it would cost me quite a bit of money and time to refile this thing and go through the whole process again. Uh, if, I, if I'm going to do that, I'd rather, you know, scrape up some money from someplace and try to keep the uh, plan the way it is. I mean, that, that, that's certainly uh, one alternative that I'm going to explore immediately. Uh, so I'll call Jason. Uh, I'll, I'll call my engineer tomorrow and I'll call the contractors that are interested in the job and try to come up with something that keeps the uh, approved alignment uh, right where it is. And uh, then I'll get back to Aaron if we can do that and try to schedule a pre-construction meeting. Uh, uh, I'm optimistic. There's no reason why we can't blow through this and get this done this year, but I got to get started at the latest uh, sometime in August. Yes, and my only comment to that is if, if you're going to stick to your approved plan, Bob, then I'm happy to come out and do pre-construction with you as soon as possible. If there are changes to the approved plan, then we've got to get them approved by the board because um, I don't have any authority to approve them, but and then, we'll Aaron, cross that bridge when we come to it. And Aaron, when is our next meeting? Um, is Bob's aware of that? It's going to be... Early August, August. August 12th. Yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, Bob, that's going to be the next earliest that we'll have a chance to talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, but if, if there's no change and you're going to stick with your original plan, then you wouldn't need to come back before the board. It's only if there's a change to it. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I stick with the original channel, uh, you know, there was still ways to cut the cost here because I don't have to take that uh, that uh, culvert head wall at the outflow out. It, it's solid as a rock, and I could leave it in there as long as it's not getting pressure from up, up, up top and uh, undermined from down below. So that that would be, uh, it, which is supposed to be the second phase of the construction. So. We might push push through the channel, the first phase, and then I might ask uh, to be to allow to abandon the the head wall in place. That that would be a cost saving uh, item, also. So I think we should maybe explore that offline a little bit, um, and then if there's if that's a proposal we want to bring before the board, we can talk about it at the next meeting once you've hammered it out. Okay, good. Thank okay. you. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Bob. So good luck. Thank you, folks. Much appreciated. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. So, Aaron, next on the agenda, are we getting close here? Yes, we are very <laughs> close. Um, I haven't even had a chance to look at our monitoring reports, but I will try to take a look at them tomorrow. Um, I had a meeting with MassDOT today um, regarding that um, determination of applicability that we issued um, to DOT for the um, repaving project on Northampton Road. Oh, yeah. um, they had concerns about treatment of the invasives there, the um, Japanese knotweed. Um, they basically said they they think it's their, their um, folks who do invasives treatment looked at it and basically said, um, and I have the documentation if you guys want to see it um, for the request. Um, let me see if I can grab it real quick. Um, but they're basically saying it's a waste of, of time and resources because um, it's there's a huge stand of, of um, Japanese knotweed that's behind the area that would be treated and it wouldn't really do anything um, to, to treat it um, because it would just 
grow back because there's a huge stand of it behind it. And after talking with them, I am inclined to agree. Uh, it doesn't really require any action on the part of the board. It's more or less just an acknowledgement that they're not going to be doing any spray treatments, just continue to mow it back. And that's basically it. Um, they just wanted to communicate that to us and make sure that we were okay with that. I totally agree. I'm in a battle right now with a grassland restoration project of my own with Japanese knotweed right in the middle of it. That's the I'm battle. I'm thinking sprouts literally every day. It's it, that's battle. Just, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just spraying a bunch of chemicals. That it's not going to do anything. Going to do then anything. It's gonna come right back up. Yeah, exactly. And the only time, the best time to do it is in the fall when they flower. But even then, you got to keep. There's a whole gotta, stand. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. If they can't touch, if they can't get the whole thing, it's not worth it. Correct, especially that big piece for of ten metal. years. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay, so there's that, and I just wanted to give you guys an update. I did walk the Luddy property with um, yeah. um, Lincoln Fish, and that property is completely overrun with invasives. <laughs> it's a mess. I can give you a more lengthy update at the next meeting, but they're not going to be starting work as as quickly as they had originally um, mentioned. So we have more time to discuss it before work starts. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to let you know, I did walk the site with him. And, and other than that, that's basically the most, the most urgent business I had on the agenda this evening. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thanks. So anybody have any other comments or questions for Aaron or anything else we have to talk about tonight? Just keep up the good work, Aaron, you're crushing it. Uh, you're like literally. literally the best. <laughs> I, I agree. Great, great. Oh, Thank you. I was all like, oh, Beth Wilson. I was like, oh, no way. No. <laughs> <That's who. Aww. laughs> oh, that's cool. We're good. That is great. We're, we're, we're all on great. the same team. We're all on the same team. Job. You make our work much easier. <laughs> Thank you. I try. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aaron. So, yeah. Okay, so with that, I think we're looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. That can't. Okay, so Anna? Aye. Laura? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Brett? Aye. We are done. Thank you all. Good to see you all. Good care. Have a good week or two weeks. <laughs>